Okay, let me see if I can do this. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mike. Happy birthday to you. Oh, thank you so much, Todd. How did that sound good? It, it didn't sound good. It sounded <laughs> great. <laughs> Everybody, welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm Todd Conklin, the host of this lovely affair. And you're getting a lot of podcast action if you're listening, but maybe that's good. Gives you something to think about. Okay, so this is back by popular demand. And that didn't take very long to get a lot of popular demand to get this back. But today's podcast, as you could safely hear by my beautiful tonal happy birthday song, is back with uh, with Mike Peters, who... Um, who is a, uh, you know, he's a psychologist who works with organizations. He works a lot of nuke power in that side of the arena. And he's going to talk a little bit more than he did for the little shorty around this notion of mindfulness. And he says something in this podcast. Oh, I shouldn't, I, I'm dying to blab it out now. I'll, I'll wait. But he said something in this podcast that changed the way I thought of mindfulness. Um, not that the last podcast wasn't, valuable and short and sweet, but this one, he talks about sort of the place where mindfulness lives. And if you think about this in kind of a high reliability standpoint, which is the way I sort of think about mindfulness as a part of resilience, this is a pretty, this was a, this, um, this made me mind blown a little bit. It made me think differently about the world in which we live. And not that I needed that because, uh, for the last month or so, I've been thinking very differently about the world in which we live already. But I found this podcast to be uh, this this conversation. When we had this talk, it was a really nice talk. And it was good to have him back on. And it was good to really let him give him some space and time to talk about this idea of living in the present, being present where you are now. And that really is big part of the idea of mindfulness. And it's interesting because you're in a position where you're, you're really forced to be in the present. You can't make a plan for tomorrow because we just don't know what tomorrow will bring. And it seems to be worse and worse news. And thinking about the past is comforting, but not very helpful because the world we left, maybe I should say that differently. The world we were jerked out of thrusted from is not the world we will return to. And so the tools we have to really monitor our own health and sanity and to help the people who work around us and for us monitor their health and sanity, those tools are pretty valuable tools. They're pretty important tools. And so that's something we want to talk about. And that's really what Mike helped us do is he helped us have a little longer conversation, albeit pretty quickly after the short conversation around this idea of what it's like in the pillar of high reliability to practice and be mindful. So I hope you're doing well. And I worry a little bit just because I have started really thinking a lot about what it's going to be like when we actually return to some semblance of normalcy, when we go to work in the places where work normally happens. And it's been very interesting to me to draw this material together and to look at the research and the writing. There's not a lot um, because this hasn't really happened before. Um, but I'm finding information that's helping me understand that the post-traumatic stress after this event is going to be significant. And you're going to really see it manifest in lots of ways within your organizations. And it's something that we should be thinking about now because it's a really important thing to have some capacity to handle when it starts. And we know resilience is the ability to function. Resilience is the capacity to fail gracefully. Resilience really is the ability to create change. And that change is coming whether we want it to or not. But that's probably a topic for another podcast. I mean, we could have it on this podcast. Well, about did. But let's actually save that for later and listen to what 
Mike Peters has to say about this idea of where we are in an uncertain world, a world filled with anxiety and fear and change, and what one of the most important tools we have, no matter how you look at the world, is the ability to to be mindful and to look at the present, not dwell in the past or worry about the future, but look at the present because the present is, in fact, the only time we have. So this was fun. It's a talk that Mike and I had. I'm so glad we could do it again. Thank you for asking to have it back, you guys. You're loud. And I got that message loud and clear. That was not a mysterious message to me. So here's Mike and I, and we'll talk about this notion uh, in a little bit more detail. Listen carefully, because there's a real nugget in here, at least for me, that I want to see if you can draw out of it. So lots of interest around this mindfulness thing. I don't think we gave him enough time last time. What do you think? What 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 should what should a person in an organization supporting other people doing work read that as a leader? I guess you know creating success around them. How should they be taking care of themselves? Oh, that's a great question. You know, and I think this is a time when we all kind of fall back on the tried and true, you know, the things that have worked for us before, you know, reaching out to people, exercising, um, getting together with groups of people we enjoy. And a lot of that stuff we can't do right now, you know? So uh, um, I think if there's ever a time for mindfulness, Todd, now's the time. And, And I am so impressed with what you do with your podcast and how you reach out and kind of take care of people in the safety world and, I'm certainly not part of that world, but I, uh, well, to some degree I am. Um, but I have just been impressed with what you do and how you do it. And I want to see how you're doing right now because you're a leader. You're leading all of us here. How are you doing through all this? You're asking us that question. How are you doing? So that's a, that's a fair question. I think it's one of the questions I've started and I'm not ditching your question. So let me just say it before we get started. <laughs> one of the questions I've started asking people is, How does the anxiety that you feel around this situation manifest in your life? And for me, I've really thought about that is, is what am I doing with this anxiety and where am I moving it? And I think it's, 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 I'm certainly filled with anxiety and I'm certainly worried about the people I care and love uh, being safe and healthy. And I'm worried about the future just of the planet which sounds really, really, really goofy when you say it, but I mean, it's, I, I, when you don't, when you don't have the ability to understand what's going to happen next, then I guess the tendency is to, is to fill that uncertainty with, with lots of worst case scenarios. I, I was talking last night to a senior leader of a large, really large organization in the United States, really high up guy. I was actually texting which I'm not that good at, Mike, but that's how <laughs> that person can chose to talk to, to me. And and the person said something. This is a really senior leader in charge of lots and lots of people's livelihoods and vital stuff. I mean, does does vital supply chain work that we need? And he told me last night, he said, I, I honestly don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so I can't really strategically plan ahead of anything. I'm entirely in the mode where I'm taking the day as it comes. And I think you can look at that two ways. You can look at that as, holy crap, this baby's out of control. Or in an essence, maybe that's where mindfulness as a, as an approach, as a leadership approach really starts to make sense. But it worries me, Mike, that when we say mindfulness, what people hear is fluffiness. They hear, um, yoga studios, yoga mats, which aren't really mats and are kind of stinky. Um, you know, (laughs) thinking about what the sound of one hand clapping is, but I don't think that's what you mean by the word mindfulness at all. No, you know, and and when I reread your your pre-accident investigations book, because I was really bored the other day. (laughs) God, you need a hobby. (laughs) I, I really reread it from the lens of, of mindfulness, you know, and I think a lot of people have innate mindfulness. You know, we call it, 
you know, uh, uh, trait mindfulness. It's just part of their personality. And, you know, when I read things in your book, you know, about, you know, the uh, error is an unexpected deviation from an expected outcome, you know, that's a true reframe, you know, uh, the acceptance that, you know, human error is inevitable, that all workers are making errors. And um, all this means is it's pretty simple. Error is everywhere. There's nothing you can do about it to avoid the errors. You can't punish the errors away. I mean, that is really mindful stuff. And you, you didn't mention the word mindfulness once, you know. One of my greatest, I think, examples of mindfulness that was really an inspiration for me when I was trying to figure out what mindfulness was, was an old book that we probably all read in college, but, you know, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Yeah, and, Frankl. Uh, what, yeah, which is, I mean, his whole thing was that we have to put – you know, it's the, it's the gap between the stimulus and response is really what we have control over, that nobody else can control that but us. So he was sitting in a concentration camp, and he was, you know, feeling compassion for the guards that were beating him up, abusing him, rather than anger, because he found that anger wasn't helpful for him. And he was able to put that gap between the stimulus and the response. Well, let me pull the fact, string on that, because I think that's... That's something that's going to resonate with people. So we don't think there is a gap between stimulus and response. In fact, we see it as kind of linear, as kind of causal. The right. stimulus creates the response. But you're actually saying there's a space there between stimulus and response that is non-causal. It's, it's not linear. It's not Newtonian. It's, it's, this, it's this place where, where we can pay attention and by paying attention, we become better. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. You know, I mean, and to quote your book again, you know, you talk about it's the terrible thing that we don't look for a construct to construct, to construct the whole story. Instead, we search, we find that one broken thing. We call it the eureka moment. You know, we call it the first thing broken out there, and then we'll fix it. You know, but that's the challenge for all of us. It's not. In effect, and that's where, you know, getting back to your point about how mindfulness is this Eastern philosophy, and it is. It's been around since you know, five, fifth century BC. Uh, it's a Buddhist tradition, and often when people even just hear that, they've like written it off. And we're selling it really short, and we need to see that yin and the yang, where you know it's not just linear, it's not just cause and effect. You know, for every complicated problem, there's a simple solution, and it's probably wrong, right? Right. And so so that's that's what mindfulness is. And um, so it was, you know, kind of brought to our awareness, our attention and, you know, by, um, you know, John Kabat-Zinn, who did a lot of work at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, mindfulness based stress reduction. Where he worked with people that had chronic pain and he was having, you know, rather than more pain medication, he was looking at yoga and meditation and mindfulness and you know he found that it was really helpful and then it started getting into the scientific literature and i don't see it a lot in the safety literature I so mean, probably so, so if i can interrupt you where you see it in the safety literature is probably not in safety but it's in high reliability so mm -hmm. they talk about mindfulness a lot when they talk about how highly reliable organizations are organized, how, how high reliability functions in organizations that are highly reliable. And it's interesting, Carl Weick, Kathleen Sutcliffe, um, gosh, the whole Berkeley clan, uh, Carlene Roberts, Todd Laporte, those guys, they've been writing about mindfulness, man, Mike, probably 20 years. But yeah. I think we, we, when there's not a necessity to understand the word better, We've looked at it, and I think we thought we knew what it meant. But in fact, what we're realizing now that there's a crisis afoot, that uncertainty is really strong, and we're in this chaotic environment, that we probably didn't understand what a mindful organization means. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so the, the literature, we, they've recognized that it's really important for resilience, and, and clearly that's what's coming out of the med school experiments as well is that if you're if you're having difficulty with severe pain what you're talking about is creating capacity to to have the pain and that's where mindfulness comes in so there's there's been to be fair there's been a a rather robust push towards mindfulness but maybe it was ahead of its time by 15 years mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, and, and, and I think that's where times like this, you know, when people are searching and reaching for things, maybe it's going to become, maybe it's going to permeate more the vernacular and, and kind of how we think about it and use it. You know, when I, yeah, and when I work with, you know, I'm working with a nuclear power plant right now, and, you know, they do an amazing job of, of being mindful, you know, when it comes to human performance and, you know, always checking um, before that they're, you know, they move ahead with things and doing, you know, pre-job briefs. Um, and all of that is about mindfulness. They never use the word, but so it's there, you know, and, and I don't want to get caught up too much in the semantics, you know. I mean, I think it's something that it, I'm glad to hear that, Todd. I'm glad to hear that it's part of that. And I listened to your podcast, excellent podcast with Sydney Decker last week. And, you know, he talks about that high reliability organizations and and that greater diversity, um, you know, creates that. That's very mindful, you know, focusing on one thing in the moment, um, deference to expertise, all of that's very, very mindful. How, how I define mindfulness and, and the kind of the popular, just for your listeners there that are probably, <laughs> have already turned us off because we're talking about mindfulness, but <laughs> paying, paying, att- <laughs> paying attention in the present moment with calm, focus, and a clear mind. Mindfulness is about learning how to effectively respond rather than react. So when I started doing mindfulness as a therapist <clears throat> years ago, I came kicking and screaming. I was working with the dialectical behavioral treatment, which was the reconciliation of opposites for people that had borderline personality disorder. So people that had, had some pretty severe abuse and, and had this all or nothing way of thinking. You know, I love you and I hate you at the same time. You know. Um, you know, uh, give me a hug and give you a slap at the same time, you know, and that's when I started looking at mindfulness as a tool to help people reconcile those opposites. And like I said, I kind of came kicking and screaming. I mean, I grew up in a nice background with a good loving home and went to church all the time. And my first ex- exposure to anything close to mindfulness was playing basketball and doing visualization when you shoot free throws. And as a very poor college, small college basketball player that sat on the bench most of the time, I took away some of those, some of those tools. um, And then it was reintroduced to me as a therapist. And I found that doing these mindfulness exercises actually, you know, with these patients, with these clients really started to help me tremendously in my personal life. The way Marsha Linehan talks about mindfulness is you know, it, it's the reconciliation of opposites. Like I said, we have an emotional mind that's all, you know, very hot, very fiery, all about emotions, all or nothing thinking. Um, and then we have a rational mind that's very logical, and research oriented, and statistics, and very cool. And the, the idea is to find that middle path, the wise mind. You know, I feel this, I know this, so I will do this. And it's what the Buddhist tradition, they talked about you know, that middle path, you know, turning mind from being willful to being willing, you know, doing the next best thing. So she talked about it as observing, describing, participating, non-judgmentally in the moment, focusing on what works. And it's moment to moment live. And again, if there's ever a moment to moment living, <laughs> now's the time. Yeah, we're deeply so, in it. I that mean, was we're, we're deeply in that yeah. for sure. And, and and so I kind of when I talk to you know executives and, and and leaders in my coaching business now, you know it's not like the first session I go into and say, all right, hey, we're gonna we're gonna talk about mindfulness and you're gonna learn these things right away. Some people ask me more and more people, Todd, are asking me for tell me about mindfulness. Talk to the CEO of you know, a few years ago, he said, all right, tell me about mindfulness and how do I get it and what do I need to do? And we're seeing more research and more literature, you know, Google and Intel and General Mills, and they all have big mindfulness programs. And so it is permeating the corporate culture in a lot of ways. Um, and John Kabat-Zinn was even kind of worried about that a little bit. He even asked the Dalai Lama, he said, you know, you feel like we're paraphrasing it, but do you feel like we're bastardizing mindfulness? Because it's all about compassion, kindness, staying in the moment, you know, doing the next best thing, selflessness, 
and now we're using it to help increase productivity and we're doing it to increase shareholder value and and the Dalai Lama just smiled and said hey you know there's there's so many Buddhists out there um, that use this all the time and we're more than happy to share this and uh, that's being truly mindful sorry I went on a tangent there about that but I I hope that helps you and your listeners I mean what's your journey with mindfulness well no I think right. it's I think it's really interesting. So probably Ellen Langer at MIT is the one that gave the the biggest point on mindfulness to me. And she defined mindfulness as the ability to walk into a room you've walked into a thousand times and see something different. But right. I, th I think that was my really good definition for mindfulness until about five minutes ago when you <laughs> talked about the space between stimulus and response. And yeah. it's, to me, that's – that's something we ought to probably pay a lot of attention to because we can either react to the stimulus or we can respond to the stimulus. And it's really a choice to a great extent that is really fundamentally built upon our ability to pause long enough to live in the current moment long enough to realize that we can impact the future. I've thought about this a ton, Mike, that there's really – three times. There's the past, the present, and the future. The past is interesting, but we can't do much about it. The future is interesting, but we have no control at all over that, and we've certainly learned that in the last month. Really, all we have is the future, or the present, and the present becomes really compelling because we spend so much time, certainly professionally, and I'm certain personally, not living in the present, either rehashing the past or freaking out about the future when in fact all we have really is right now. Mm -hmm. That's so well said, you know, in, in AA, they say it very well. Some of my clients over the years that have been in AA, and they say, when you have one foot in tomorrow and one foot in yesterday, you're pissing on today. <laughs> and, uh, you know, do you believe that, Todd? Does that give belief? Yeah, I, I think that's probably really, <laughs> I've never heard that before, but uh, I think that's probably yeah. pretty true. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about right there. Yeah, yeah. I I look at it as the acronym I use because you know we all the world needs more acronyms, right? Right. Yeah, um, can, especially <laughs> us. We don't have nearly enough. <laughs> right. But I look at it as an order. You know, when clients and organizations you know come to me, they're wanting to clarify and prioritize their values and their strengths and and achieve something. And uh, you know, so I I break it down in in that acronym is order is just observing, you know, participating in the feeling. The R is repeat. And I think that's a piece of mindfulness that helps in that, stim that gap between stimuli and response. You know, we're barraged with millions of bits of information and thoughts in our brain every moment the neurologists or neuroscientists say, we can really only attend to 40 of them and really only attend to one or two if we're really focused, and, and that's, you know, the myth of multitasking, but repeating, you know, now I'm walking, now I'm fixing dinner, now I'm washing the dishes, now I'm, you know, spraying Lysol on the bottom of my shoes, now I'm washing my vegetables in vinegar water, now I'm being told by my wife that, you know, I forgot to uh, not walk into the kitchen, you know, I mean, all of that involves that mindfulness. And if we repeat what we're doing, that helps give us some stimuli, that gives some gap between that stimuli and response. And the D is that's so important, that don't judge. You know, just be kind, be compassionate to yourself and to others. You know, um, don't judge. Judgment is that anxiety that you're talking about, Todd. You know, that all or nothing thinking, that the world is going to end. This is, um, I'm, my business is going to go under. Nobody's going to listen to my podcast. You know, that's all those judgmental thoughts that just get us stuck in anxiety. Um, and, and then the E is just engage. You engage in the present moment and focus on what works. And I have a whole list of, I don't know, interventions or ideas, you know, for clients in that way. And then finally, repeat the process. You know, our mind wanders 50% of the time. I mean, do you find that, Todd? Do you, I mean, you, you're so prolific with writing and speaking and organized, you know, behavior, but does your mind wander all the time? Yeah, I'd say 50% is probably low. 
Uh, I have a hard time tracking, you know, five minutes. <laughs> right. And that's normal, you know. And so we have to repeat this order over and over again. And that's where people get, you know, frustrated with mindfulness in some ways because it does involve a lot of repetitiveness and a lot of practice. But, you know, you can know how to lift weights and read all about it. But if you don't go in there and lift weights every day, if you don't have a, a practice of exercise, you're not going to get any stronger. And that's true for mindfulness, too. And uh, like I said, I've come kicking and screaming for the whole idea of mindfulness. But now it's just an important part of my daily routine. And, and really, this is an opportunity for your listeners to explore more about mindfulness and um, and use it as part of their survival techniques. So you love order. Oh, that sounded mm-hmm. weird. It's, it's weird. You love the acronym O-R-D-E-R. Saying someone loves right. order strikes me as your, that seems kind of accusatory. So let's go with the acronym. But if, right. you had, if you had one piece of advice to give somebody who's in the midst of it, one, mm-hmm. one thing they could try to increase their ability to understand mindfulness, what would it be? What, what, would, what would be the one thing you think has the most ability to immediately make a difference? And it very well could have been the statement you made, the space between stimulus and response. I mean, that, that was mm-hmm. really valuable. But what do mm-hmm. you think about that? I think to breathe. How amazing, you know, really? Yeah. You know, that's the everywhere, as long as we're on this earth, that's what we have. And we're being reminded more and more by the lack of ventilators and, and the impact of the coronavirus, how important breathing is. But really, our breath is what anchors us in mindfulness. And it's always there and so if you can just take a few moments to take, take a you know, deep breath or not even worry about how deep you're breathing, just breathe and just count your breaths and be aware of your breaths. That's one of the most important anchors of mindfulness. And it's and so interesting. Give you some time. It feels like I need to say this, Gypsy, because I, you're about the farthest guy away from a sunflower seed, hippie, lovey-dovey, uh, you know, you're just, you're not that guy at all. And yet you're giving kind of hippie lovey dovey advice. How do you justify that? Yeah. Well, as I said, you have to meet the client where they're at, you know? So when I'm talking to a, a lieutenant of security at a nuclear power plant, he comes in with his gun strapped to his you know, chest um, and is struggling with all sorts of interpersonal conflicts and interpersonal effectiveness I don't lead with mindfulness, you know, I just do a lot of listening and try to meet the client where they're at, find out what they're wanting. Um, And through the course of, you know, modeling, uh, through the course of how I respond, uh, we we start seeing people kind of adapt to those, um, you know, those, that ability, you know, to, to calm themselves down. So, yeah, it's it's a you know Henry Ford said you know if I gave the people what they wanted I'd make a faster horse right um, we got to meet the client where they're at but we also have to you know recognize that um, there's some layers of of, um, of you know, judgment when it comes to mindfulness for sure yeah no no question how are you doing doing well. Um, it's a strange time and I know all the euphemisms apply right now, but, uh, it's, it's, um, my wife is in healthcare, so I worry about her going to homes, doing, you know, home health as a physical therapist. I worry about my family. Um, but I'm also enjoying the opportunity to stretch myself a little bit and what I'm doing, what I'm learning and who I'm reaching out to and trying to take this, see this as a, I hate to use the word, but as an opportunity, you know, to, um, you know, stretch myself and, and to do more mindfulness and do more reading and be more connected.
And that notion, thank you, Mike Peters, is really the beginning primer on self-care, self-help, mindfulness, living in the moment. That whole idea of mindfulness exists between the space between stimulus and response really made me think differently about mindfulness. I mean, to a great extent, we call that content. We call that a lot of stuff, but it, it, it takes the world from a two valued kind of linear notion to a much more uh, advanced holistic understanding that there really is a space between stimulus and response. And it's a place where we may not have a lot of direct control depending on how you feel about free agency, but we do have the opportunity to be more aware, more mindful. And now I can see why Carl and Carlene and, the whole high reliability gang really talked about the notion of mindfulness. I can understand better where mindfulness plays into reliability and resilience. It makes more sense to me. That's for sure. And it's a really good thing to think about. Thank you, Mike. That was really pleasant. And I'm glad you could help us. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourself. Learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, you guys be kind and be safe.